The Delaware County Historical Society presents The Delaware Blizzard of 1978, presented by Brent Carson and Rex Welker. On March 2, 2017, Brent Carson led a program about the blizzard of 1978. During the program, headlines from the Delaware Gazette, Daily Paper, and photographs from the newspaper illustrated the impact of the blizzard in Delaware County. The headlines and photographs were selected from the daily newspapers and the photograph negatives, which the owners of the newspaper donated to the Historical Society in 2011. During the program, many individuals from the audience shared their memories of the blizzard experience. You know, the blizzard, for those of you who are not old enough to remember, we're not talking about something that you buy at Dairy Queen. <laughs> and we're not talking about these snow furries. We are talking about the event of the century as far as the winter event in this area. And we're going to hopefully share a lot of stories from this audience who I know have stories of where they were during the blizzard of 78. And we're going to start right here with the weather report. Don't worry, it's that January 24th, 1978. Occasional rain developing, developing this afternoon, possibly beginning with freezing rain. Highest today will be between 35 and 40. Rain changing to snow tonight and continuing Wednesday. With lows tonight in the mid-20s and high Wednesday in the mid-30s. So there's the weather report for the day before the blizzard. And so we begin. And here we go with headlines from the gazettes during that time period. Wednesday, January 25th, rain, ice pose a new danger. Slippery is the word over most of Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> And there you have it, no gazette. <coughs> now I want to go back though to that night before the blizzard. Remember what was going on that night? It was pouring down rain, yes. Pouring down rain and, uh, and no prediction yet of this storm that was to come. Carolyn and Shelby. We were at Buckeye Valley High School in the 4 8 meeting. The weatherman from WMRN was there, and he told us before, before we left that the big weather change was coming in. Now, he didn't say it was going to be a blizzard, but he said there was going to be a change that we would remember. And when we went out, it was raining, and when we went home, it had snowed a little bit, but it was raining. And we thought, well, he missed it. And when we woke up in the morning, we realized. And he was right. And he said you all feel rather full. And he says that the bar barometric pressure is making you feel that way. And we didn't have a big meal, but that was true. We did feel different, like we were kind of on edge. And uh, the next morning, we got it. But it was... There was a lot of rain and thunder that night, yeah. and he said, he told us exactly what was going to happen, and it did. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, this weatherman giving a program on the weather, he had a barometer with him, right? And he, he got to look at, he got to, he got to looking at this barometer and realizing how quickly it's dropping. And he thought something is terribly wrong, and I think it's time we all go home. That uh, although it's raining now, he said, this is going to be quite a storm, and I think we'd better call this off and go home. I thought the world was coming to the end. That was in Westerville, and uh, it was thunder snow, and that's like a very rare, according to the Weather Channel, it's a very rare event. So we were lucky to have witnessed it. Those, those of us who were outside wondering what's going on. <laughs> yes. I, I take that back. I'm going to go, go back a year for a moment. 
1977. I can remember listening to the radio, and I lived on East William Street in Delaware. When I woke up, there was a commentator by the name of Bob Connors out of Columbus. And he said on the radio that morning, don't be deceived of what's going on outside right now. Nothing is happening. This is going to be, he said, the worst weather day in Ohio's history. Now that was in 1977, the year before. He said, we are in for a blizzard today. Well, he was right. We did. That was the year that we went to school and the superintendent didn't believe it and said, no, there's nothing happening. Well, we weren't there long on 1977. The next year, everybody, by that time, by the morning of the blizzard, uh, schools were off. And uh, they did not attend that day. Well, I want to get into the stories that you all have. And uh, let's go to our next slide though, right here. Record blizzard chokes the county. Now we're on Friday, January 27th. Stay home, say officials. 2,000 people moved in the city during the storm. 1,000 evacuated in county areas. And on Friday, also, greatest disaster, as the governor said. And here is a command center of, uh, as they were carrying on rescue operations. I believe the man on the left is Don Fisher. I'm not sure who the man in the middle is. Jim Whitney. Jim Whitney, okay. And Rick English. Rick English, right. Now you would probably know that because also, didn't you take these pictures? I did. Step up to the child at the time and said. Now, Rex Rucker, we pulled a lot of these photographs out of the Delaware Gazette, or out of our, yes, Delaware Gazette archives at the Delaware County Historical Society. And thanks to, uh, to uh, Paul Monks, I think Paul's back here, and some others uh, were able to pull some of these out and share them with you tonight. So let's go through some of these and you talk about them, Rex, because you know about this here. Well, one, one thing I wanted to mention is, is that slide back there, it said no newspaper. I remember I got up the morning of the blizzard. I didn't know we were having a blizzard. I drove to work. I lived at home. It was before I got married. And our Ruth, of course, friends with Mel, and, and, and Tommy Thompson and I were at the Gazette and a couple other people, some other newspapers, people, and, and we were trying to decide if we could publish a paper because Tommy was very upset. The only time the Gazette had not published a newspaper was during the 1913 flood. And he really wanted to put out the paper, but he realized if we did get it printed, there was nobody to deliver it. <laughs> uh, th this was, uh, when I wrote around, people remember Bill Smith, uh, he was Sergeant Smith at the police department and then later became a captain. So originally I, I wrote around with him the first day of the blizzard and, and uh, this is, London Town residents, they took him over to Congress School, and the way I got around during the blizzard is, is Bill Smith drove his, one of the station wagons around, and, and uh, I remember we were going south on Sandusky Street, and there's some guy walking during the blizzard, so he pulls over, there isn't anybody out, and says, I, I need to give you a ride, and he says, I don't need the ride, and it was real apparent he'd been drinking somewhere. <laughs> so Bill got him in the back seat of the car and took him home, and then later on, with the radio, the police radio, he kind of went around and, and took me around, so it was very, very nice. Here's, here's in Congress School. Thank you. Okay, that's the uh, National Guard Armory. This is John Cross. I remember John. John's still in town. I don't know who the other two people are. I, I do, uh, they did give me a ride. I did ride in a deuce and a half. They called out the National Guard, and I rode in that for a while to take some pictures. I think that was about the third day I was out on the Oh, my, yeah. And this was right across from the Delaware Gazette. You can see the Sahil sign that's that's a BP station. Yeah. Yeah. I have no idea who those people are. They're fools. <laughs> oh, here was another thing. I don't know, Mel. Uh, do you want to talk about Ernie's house? 
You were you were on the fire department. Sheldon was on the fire department. Ernie Gambos, which you want. I, I remember, what I remember is Art Ruth. You want to talk about it? Remember the fire show? Oh, yes. Okay. Well, well I, I don't remember the fire. Nobody remembers. Nobody. <laughs> what I remember is Art Ruth, who I worked with at the Gazette. He was also on Tri Township Fire Department. We have at least three, I think, members of the Tri Township Fire Department from then. Ernie, what I remember the story that Art told me is that when you had the fire at Penn Wall or Penn Saw, it had ruined the paint on the trucks. Right. So Ernie worked at PPG and repainted all the trucks for you for free. And then the next thing that happens is Ernie Ernie lived on Coover Road. Well, anybody that's ever driven down Troy Road knows that that drifts all the time. Oh, no. And the end of Coover Road, you know how the big Coover Road in 23? Yeah. That was drifted shut and Ernie's house got on fire <coughs> and Tri Township couldn't get their new Newly painted trucks. There was no way to get to his house, and it burned. You get the old ones there. Yeah, you couldn't get anything. There. It was just so Ernie's Ernie's house burned to the ground, and they just couldn't get there. Oh, that's the LK. Apparently, they did have uh, some of the downtown had electricity. I know that I didn't go home for a couple days. I I, I stayed uh, with a fellow reporter, uh, Rob Anthony, lived over. Um, not a motto's pizza, but that side there, and he lived upstairs and he had heat, so I just spent a couple nights with him on the couch. Uh, on my car sat out in front of the Gazette for about two days or three days. Now, Rex, as I understand in that last picture there, the, the window is out of, uh, one of the windows is out of the LNK uh, there on the left, but that that did not blow out during the blizzard. Two people got in a fight there, and, and, and folks broke up. So, anyway, go right ahead. If you're old enough to remember the LK, you're old enough to remember the blizzard. Yes, yes. Of course, this is South and Dusky Street after it's been plowed. <coughs> That's what, of course, there wasn't many parking places at the time. Hi, I'm Barb Tall. And we had a son who was a student at Ohio Wesleyan, and he was in Austin Manor and was in down what they call the crypt, which was down in the basement and just had one little window up there. Well, when the storm came in and there was no electricity, they were, it was just black. And we were hearing that, you know, on the radio, we did have the radio, and we had no electricity, but we had gas. And our gas uh, stove and our... Uh, a gas heater uh, worked and so uh, Bob and Mary Holmes, the Holmes all moved into our house and we were having a fine time and the radio said no one's moving across town, nothing's happening and all of a sudden the back door opened, our son and four students from Ohio Wesleyan <laughs> they, they decided just going any place across town was better than staying down in the basement, so that's what we had. <laughs> Maybe those people in the blizzard, was your one of them your son that was walking down the <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So this is uh, the U.S. store downtown. So, of course, as soon as people could get out, there, everybody was out of milk, out of bread, out of cheese. So, uh, as soon as things started opening up, shoppers started getting wherever they could. Yeah. National Guard Armory, they, they actually, what well says 217 civilian, the guardsmen slept there. So, they had heat. Uh, if you have boiler heat, some of, the, some of those worked. You know, they might not have electric, but they still had heat. Snowmobiles. The, the, when we finally did publish the Gazette, I remember, I don't know who remembers Norm Matthews. He was a freshman at the Gazette. Well, Norm, they, they got him into the Gazette, and, and he lived out in Delaware Meadows, so he had to get back home. So, but the police station at that time was right next to the Gazette. So they, had, they arranged for a snowmobile to bring him home. Well... He got almost home, and the guy hit a bank of snow, and the snowmobile went one way, and he went the other way, and he said, I can walk from here. <laughs> of course, you know, working for the Gazette, I had to show our, our carriers delivering. But here, 
Yeah. If you notice, that was the, uh, they tore down the old Delaware Hotel. So that was when the, in the era when the old Delaware Hotel was torn down and they built the new bank building. So that's what that is in the background. National Guard Armory. I don't, I didn't take quite all, I don't think I did all at the Armory because we had, uh, there was a couple reporters that were also taking pictures. Eric Rick English again. I, he's retired uh, Sheriff's Deputy. Over on uh, Winter Street across from the Strand was folks. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Me Cerrito today, right? Yes. Yes. We are up to Monday now on the headlines. And Monday, January 30th, so went from Wednesday to the following Monday. And our next one. The highway patrol um, post down and still in the same location. This was Lieutenant Davies. I don't know if anybody remember Lieutenant Davies. He was he was post commander here. Um, he later became the commander of the highway patrol in Columbus. He was promoted up to to uh, whatever they call that. But he started out here in Delaware as post commander. This was a common means of transportation during the blizzard because. It, now, everybody, this is pretty obvious to say, of course, there wasn't cell phones. The four-wheel drives are not what we have today. There was not nearly as many four-wheel drives. A lot of us just go out and buy a car now, and they're all-wheel drive, and there wasn't that. So people were driving where they shouldn't be driving, and then they got stuck and just abandoned the roads, and then the county couldn't, town or the state couldn't clean them off because there was cars on them. Randy Ray taking a nap there at the National Guard. Okay, I, the second day of the blizzard, or, or when they really the blizzard kind of stopped and, and were cleaning up, I rode around with Jim Whitney, who was county commissioner. I think commissioner was his last name because everybody went up to him. He said, Jim Whitney, county commissioner. Jim Whitney, county commissioner. He was working for votes during the blizzard. I can tell you that. So this. This was a county-owned truck that was four-wheel drive, but the good part is it had a radio in it. So if we did get stuck anywhere, or stranded anywhere, we had means of communications back to the county garage. And uh, that's on Fulton Creek. We went over in the Ostrander area, and I, I tell you, one of the things that really impressed me about the blizzard is there was a lot of neighbors helping neighbors. You know, if you had a, a four-wheel drive, or if you had a bobcat, there was a smart that lived over in Ostrander that had a huge bulldozer, and he was cleaning off the roads over there. This is just another road drifted, smart road inside the township. That, that's the Ohio Wesleyan uh, on uh, Elizabeth there, the, the music center. Car that, Sanborn Hall, yes. And this is not a county vehicle. I'm pretty sure this was a private, I don't think this was county, it could have been township, but I think it was a private, uh, one of the farmers over there had that, or... or uh, I think that was Fisher's Sawmill. Fisher's? Fisher's Sawmill? Yeah, yeah it could have been. Yeah. Could have been. Yeah, that's right. Here's, here, this is the smart that had this bulldozer, mm -hmm. and uh, they were cleaning off the roads on Brindle Road. I mean, it, it was huge. I don't know what kind of damage it was doing to the road, but it, uh, it, 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 it pushed a lot of snow, I can tell you that. This was a, a carpenter family. I, they spent two days at the uh, armory, and I remember riding in the truck to take them home to, uh, I'm not, I think it was down, down off of 257, if I remember. I, I'm not positive at this point. It was 40 years ago. Yes, uh, 42. 42. 5330. Yeah, US 42, I guess I do remember better than I thought. Well, we are now up to what day are we there? Thursday. On oh, Thursday. Oh, that, oh, hey, that was, that's not me. That's Forrest, that's Forrest Dunn on a snowmobile. I can tell you who that is. He was, uh, I think he might have been, was he in your class, Paul? Yeah. yeah Forrest Dunn Jr. He was, he was out helping, 
Anybody have snowmobile and uh, if they could get a hold of them at the uh, police station, they were out helping. It is. That is not me. Well, we, we're not done sharing memories, but no. uh, this is our last slide. Thank you, Rex. For... <laughs> to be going on East William Street, I was invited to, uh, when they saw me standing in a window, and they were riding by in a vehicle, they said, would you like to come to Tri-Township Fire Department? We could use your help. And my role was to, on late night, to, uh, to uh, man the radio that was there, which was a fascinating experience because you got to hear what was going on all over, and uh, of them trying to open roads and so forth and, and rescue people. Uh, all over, not just Delaware County, but you could hear the reports from nearby counties. Um, the one that I do remember was on the corner of Section Line Road and Airport Road, up near the Delaware Airport. There was a man by the name of Pud Owen, Bernard Owen, who worked for the county, and he was trying to open that road and it went on for a long, long time that night. And it got to the panic stage almost because he was running low on gas. And he said, I can open it one direction, but it closes behind me before I can get turned around and go the other direction. I don't know if I'm going to make it out of here. And finally he broke through and managed to, to, uh, to escape and uh, get the vehicle out of there. That leads me into an incident here in Delaware County regarding the Tri-Township Fire Department and a guy by the name of Mel Evans. And uh, Mel, step up here, please. I grew up with Brent. <laughs> yes, you did. Or he grew up with me. Yes. I'm, older. Uh, I'm a little hard of hearing, and so any of you people that can't hear, just turn your hearing aid down. <laughs> um, the blizzard of 1978 is something I'll never forget. I've thought about hundreds of times because I almost lost my life there and it still bothers me. But I was on Tri Township Fire Department and I managed the implement division of the um, Delaware Farms Exchange. And we had a four wheel drive tractor and I tried to find out, and I don't remember now why we had the tractor over there at the firehouse, and it was plugged in so it would be, the engine would be warm, we could go anytime. And I was a 33-year-old bachelor out on a date the night before, and uh, got in the car, we went out to dinner and headed home, and it, it was raining like cats and dogs, and all of a sudden it was snowing like you couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. Got the gal home and got back to my house. About 5.30 in the morning, the uh, fire department called me and said, get over here, we've got problems. And so I got over to the firehouse and, they, and the blizzard, of course, was going on. It was a mess. And had to go down and pick up Don Fisher, who was the county administrator at the time on Clark Charlotte Road. Really. Now that tractor was 300 horsepower, the tires were as tall as I, four-wheel drive, articulating, and I got in that tractor, made my way down, and got Don in the tractor with me. Now, there's no buddy seats in that tractor. There are today, but not that tractor. There are no buddy seats. This is a brand new tractor. Anyhow, we uh, got him in the car, or in the, in the tractor, we started up Liberty Road, and whiteouts were everywhere, and we're going up through there, and all of a sudden, I thought there was a whiteout, and then I could see, and I hit the brakes and clutch, and when they stopped the nose of that tractor right on a car, right just there, that car was right there. Got out, and there was nobody in it, so I made my way around it, finally got Don up here at the courthouse, dropped him off. Went back to the firehouse, and they started sending me various ways, places. Uh, I remember going to, what's the trailer corridor from Case Road? Anyhow, 
doctor, the lady was going to have a baby, and they needed to get her to the fire or to the hospital. So I drove the tractor up there, got that lady up in there with me, and of course, like I say, there's no bunny seat. <laughs> and this woman's water had broke. Oh. And I'm thinking, hmm, bad. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be interesting. So yeah. I uh, got, got going, come across the Stone Mill Bridge up here, and a squad met me there. And we got her out of there and got her in the squad, and I took her to the hospital and 10 minutes later she had a baby. So I didn't have to pay Dr. Mel anything like that. And I don't know the lady's name, but I, I found out later that she she had the baby 10 minutes afterwards. To get on with the story, we there was so much out there. Actually, the people that lived in the city had it much better. Much better. Because out in the country, there were drifts, oh, 20 feet high. Yeah. at least and snowmobiles were a blessing because I can remember Odie Baxter delivering medicine and so on to people that needed medicines and stuff like that he used to own the bowling alley and then they sent me uh, up to Hanover Road and we were supposed to start to evacuate the trailer court instead we got stuck and say, I say we, Dave McQuarrie was with me, and he was, I think, 10 years younger than me, 23 or so. And how you get a big tractor like that stuck? I did. It bellied out. And you could it'd sit there, it would move this way back and forth because it articulated in the middle. And you couldn't do anything. And I had no shovel even get out to try to shove ourselves. That was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and we did have a two-way radio in the tractor to communicate with the base. And they kept, periodically, they would say, we got so-and-so trying to get to you. Come up, and so on and so forth. And we think, oh boy, you know, and then all of a sudden, they say, we got to turn back. And this went on and on and on until 10.30 that night. And Dave and I were sitting in that tractor, and they had the engine running. I had it was full of fuel, but after that point, things went worse. They said, "Okay." They finally got Rick Scott and Art got a truck to us, and I don't remember that other road over there. But I we had to walk three quarters of a mile in the blizzard. And if you've ever walked in a cold snow and somebody sh shoots rock saw at you, that's what it felt like. Your face was just pitted with that snow. It's like 70, 80 mile an hour winds. We got out of the tractor and I said to Dave, I said, Dave, over here in the field, we could walk. But I said, we got to stay in this road that we couldn't even see, but we could see poles. And I said, the road's got to be in where the poles are. When because if we get over here, we get turned around, we'll never find them. We'll get lost. So let's stay right here. We walked and waded in snow this deep. And I'll never forget, we didn't go too far. And then wind would, it, it would just suck your breath right out of it. And we uh, went a ways and we stopped at the car. I walked right across the hood. I'm walking right here to the hood and sit down on the top of it to rest. And we sat there a few minutes and when then we went again. And we kept going and going and tried down and up. And we were so exhausted and Dave said to me, he said, Mel, why don't you stay? He said, I'll go on and get help and come back. And I said, I'll be damned, you're not leaving me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said, no way. And so we ended up walking on out, and we got within, I'd say, two, three hundred feet of the fire truck that was sitting there. And we both were so exhausted, we just couldn't go, and both of us at the same time just fell right in the snow. We couldn't even hardly raise our heads. Art and Rex thought they saw something move, and got out, came out, and found us in the snow. As we found out later, it was not us that they thought they saw. But they picked us up and 
got us into the truck and took us to the hospital and everything was fine from there on. I can only say that I asked my dad, who was born in 1909, and Carolyn's father, who's my uncle, uh, was born in 1903. I said, did you ever see anything like this in your life? They said, absolutely not. Never. I don't know that that's a hundred year thing, but I don't want to see enough. <laughs> and I know that I'm not going to get in the track and just wait. <laughs> Thank you, Mel. I've heard that story, and, and it's, uh, it's hard to believe that someone would have to, or have to go through that kind of an ordeal, but uh, you survived it. And, uh, we have other stories, I'm sure, for people out here in this audience. Would you come up here, please, and, uh, and tell us your story? My name's Jim Keyes. I live in Arlington now, but during the blizzard, uh, my wife and I lived on Bunty Station Road. And, uh, and when you talk about the blizzard being worse in the country than in the city, I suppose that's true. I wasn't in the city that much during the blizzard. I did, however, work for WRFD Radio. And 3 o'clock Tuesday morning, the news director at WRFD called and said it was an all-hands-on-deck deal to get down to the station because we want to broadcast 24-7 um, until we're done. So I got down, got in the car, drove down there. As you've been saying, the snow was monumental, the ice was monumental. I couldn't see where I was going, but I got to the station about three in the morning, and we started broadcasting around the clock. Now WRFD is a daylight station, as you probably know. The licenses varies from month to month, but sign on, sign off. We said, well, <clears throat> nuts to that, uh, and we checked with the FCC, and indeed in an emergency, you can stay on because we shared uh, airspace with CBS Radio in New York. But that didn't matter, we stayed on. So we became sort of a clearinghouse for, for uh, emergencies and information uh, on a much broader area, because WRFD signal at night is a monster. It covers a lot of area. And so we had calls from Cleveland, Chicago, Cincinnati. We had a lot of emergencies. We know of a heart attack that we saved. We don't know of any babies that we save, but the same kind of stories that you've been sharing about folks in distress and how folks were able to get to them. Well, we were the information center, and we would forward what we had or what needed to be done to the National Guard, and they would go out and help out. Um, at one point, a National Guard helicopter came over to the station, and did anybody want to see the area from there? So I did. And we got to wondering, I wonder what the truck stops are doing. So we hopped in the helicopter, went out on 70 West. I don't know if it's still there, but there was a truck stop. Pretty busy one. And what's going on? This is probably 4 or 5 in the morning. And yes, indeed, they were very busy. Uh, they did have food. Uh, couldn't, couldn't count the number of trucks that were there. Um, and there was considerable commerce going on. <coughs> Uh, in the trucks and <laughs> inside his butt. So we didn't think that was anything worth reporting, so we went back to the station. Um, the thing that I remember about it um, was the sense of urgency and yet the sense of, we'll take care of this. Because there were six, six folks there with one gal and five guys down at the station following the wires, following the radio news networks, other stations, we were in communication with all the stations in central Ohio. What do you got? Here's what we have, that kind of a thing. Um, and we got, I forget what day we left, it was around the clock, we would take turns sleeping. There was one blanket in the whole station. We didn't plan on this. Um, we had one blanket in case you wanted to keep warm, and it was a little bit of a problem to keep warm. So we shared that blanket um, one by one. I don't remember what we ate because there really wasn't anything in the way of food in the station on a routine basis. In about the third day, we were able to go over to Green Meadows. I think it was Nationwide Training Center at that point. Mean, it still is. And we, could, we talked them out of some food. So we brought that over after about the second or third day because there wasn't anybody there either. Um, 
But what I remember most about the blizzard, we lived on Bunny Station, we had horses. And um, we had a friend down the road, um, a guy named Otis Coy. Now, Otis Coy was pretty determined to have his cigarettes. And, but his tractor, actually, he couldn't get through the snow because there had been no plowing on Bunny Station. We, however, had some horses our, at our place. And so my wife decided and offered to ride Mackett, one of the quarter horses, from Art House at 1920 Bunny Station down to Gabby's at Bunny Station. And, uh, and for some reason or another, Gabby's was open. It made Otis very happy. Uh, but we did that, got that done, and Mackett didn't know any better, or he was the best horse that ever got made. Uh, he rode, uh, took Sheila down the highway, uh, down the road, I should say, and got what we needed, what they needed, and came back. And the snow was up to your stirrups, um, and away he went. And then when it came time for me to come home, I wasn't going to bring the car, all the, I couldn't get my car all the way from the station to where I lived because it was still pretty blocked. Uh, so, uh, I could, however, get to Gaddy's. And um, so, Sheila got on Mackett, came down, picked me up, and we rode uh, double back up to the farm. You know where, I guess, there's a Liberty Road. That's, that's where we were, close to Liberty Road in Bunny Station. So, I can remember going back and forth on Mackett. Now, Mackett wasn't much good for anything else. Uh, he was the dumbest horse we ever had. But, uh, he, was, he was a sweetie. But nonetheless, he did that for us. And so I still remember the sense of being part of it and certainly being part of the media. There was no fake news going on. <laughs> we did it for real. And uh, a lot of good people were in touch. We did, however, have one call that we were a little upset about. Uh, people would call in, because we were taking phone calls on the air. Hello, what's your problem? And the problem was that they had run out of ice at their par at their party. <laughs> and, and we thought that was pretty bad, so we hung up. <laughs> but a very memorable thing, and, and, and in retrospect, a fond recollection of life in Delaware. Um, I, we since we have moved away back down to Columbus, but uh, that is a very, when we saw, by the way, your web, you know, Facebook, you know my wife, Barbara, Barbara, Barbara Allen, I'll bet. Okay. Yep. Well, yeah. she follows, uh, follows Facebook faithfully. Great. She saw an announcement of this event, and she made me come up. She said, Jim, you have to go to that because of the blizzard stories that, that you right. share. So I'm very happy to do so, and do so, and see you all. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that, that story. I appreciate hearing that. Others? I'm Reggie Powell. Um, I am not from Delaware. I actually grew up in Attica, Ohio, if you know where that is, up on Route 4. And I was in the country. We lived right on Route 4. I was 14 years old. My dad was the manager of the, Ohio, of the Attica Rural Electric Company. And he paced the floor like a caged bobcat during this whole storm. And he finally got a hold of the guys up and said, come get me because I need to man the radio. I need to man the phones for the electric company. And the boys came out on a snowmobile and took him up to work. Now my mother was with my grandpa up in Attica and I was 14 years old and there were chores to do. Wow. We had chickens, we had cows, and we had a dog. And I thought I was big stuff. <laughs> we did not lose electricity. We had the phone. And, uh, of course, the water in the chicken coop froze up. So I took a quart can and filled it with water and sat it under the heat lamp because that's all I could think of to do. But I went out. I fed the cows, and I don't know how I made it down to the barn, but in February, we had nine days of school, the whole month of February. And in March and April, we went on Saturdays to help make up the time. 
and that's what I remember about the blizzard. <laughs> um, living on Route 4, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Route 4, but it runs north-south. This storm came from the west. The, the snow was as tall as I am. I mean, I'm only five-something. They could not get snow plows through. So they sent two bulldozers, one on one half, one on the other half. And those two bulldozers went down Route 4 to clear the road. I remember that very clearly. It was amazing. That's, that's country out in Seneca County, uh, blizzard of 1978. You mentioned about feeding the cows. I know my, we had a farm just west of town. And my father, uh, the house was about a hundred yards, perhaps away from, away from the barn, and the whiteouts, not being able to see the barn from that distance, and so we had a carport behind the house, and the car was pulled up there, and he remembered he had a roll of, of uh, baling, twine, in one of the side rooms there, and brought it out, tied it to the bumper of the car and then around his waist. He wanted to make sure that if he got turned around in that snow, just in that short distance, that he was able to pull himself back to the house. But, uh, well, somebody else here. Yes? I can give you a little insight of what was going on in the rest of the state. At that time, we were living in Lima, Ohio, and I was in Pittsburgh that day on business. And we had gone out to the airport to fly home. We would normally fly home from Pittsburgh to Dayton, drive up from Dayton to Lima. And we got to the airport about mid-afternoon. All the flights were canceled. Couldn't get a flight. So we went down to the rental car. All the cars were rented. So we're wondering what we're going to do. And up walks a guy dangling the keys in front of the clerk behind him. He says, I've got a car I'm supposed to turn in here, but I'm going to take it to Dayton. You better stop me if you want to. And she said, have a nice trip, sir. We grabbed that guy and rode home with you. Normally, it's a five-hour drive. We made it slightly over two hours. That was the most harrowing ride of my life. <laughs> but we got, we dumped him off at his house, went out to the airport, got our cars. It was just starting to get dark. And we headed up the line of coming up 75. And thank God the wind was out of the west because it was blowing so hard, the road was clear. You couldn't see beyond your headlights but the road stayed clear. And we got home, it was dark, made it home, and that night I just prayed the electricity wouldn't go on. We had electricity the whole time. Our neighbors didn't, so for the rest of the week, we partied on our side of the street to make the neighbors get warm. But two, two events happened that kind of relate to what you talked about. They had a fire out west of town in an old neighborhood we lived in, where it was prone to drifting even in a light snow. You know, house caught on fire, fire truck went out, it got stuck. They sent a Sherman tank with a blade on it from the National Guard. It got stuck, bottomed out. And then they brought in a D8 tractor to try to move the fire truck down toward the fire, but they would drift so fast behind the tractor that the truck still couldn't go. And by then the house had burned down, so they just let it burn. But your trip across the field, you had a guy who worked at the Ford plant there, got within a half a mile of his house and started across the field to go home. He made it about halfway and they found him two days later. Um, it was a dangerous night. And it was, but Lima had a lot of interesting things. We finally got out three days afterwards. We lived a quarter mile from the grocery store. Took the sled down and you know, stocked up on milk and bread and things like that. The thing I remember about going to the grocery store, most of the stocks were gone, but the beer shelves were completely empty. <laughs> <laughs> one beer, you couldn't get one anymore. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes. How about stepping right on up here? And in the meantime, I, I see while you're coming up, I know you, Barb, you have another comment. Yes. Mentioning Route 75, we had friends that lived in, um, uh, in uh, 
Bowling Green, and they were on their way up 75, and the storm came on so quickly that cars going on, and then they couldn't move anymore. And so they just had to park their car, and they had a bus or something came along and picked people up and took them to the next stop. They had to abandon the car. The car was there. So then when they were clearing the road, they just pushed the cars off <laughs> as well as anything else. Wow. And it was about a week later that he could locate his car. Wow. Pass that right on to, to, to this gentleman right here. I used to live in western Ohio off of Old 3 Real close there to the, yeah, we go. Old 3C Highway up off of Paul Road. And um, I worked as a teacher down in uh, Lancaster, Fairfield Union High School. It was 60 miles one way. But anyway, that was, the school was closed for two weeks to one of the problems. But my wife worked for the Bureau of Disability, which was on Morse Road. And we didn't know whether the Bureau was closed or not because they didn't put anything on the radio. So we get in an old AMC Hornet Sport about Wagon where the radio didn't work. And spent um, an hour going in a 15 minute drive. Got down in front of the Bureau and the Morse Road was four, four or five inches of snow all the way across. They said it was closed. Go back home. So we spent another hour trying to get back home, and on some of the bridges we went sideways, and it was kind of scary. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was uh, an interesting time. And then in the spring, when everything thawed out, our gas pipes ruptured. Oh, oh yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. I live. I lived on Newman's Cardington Road uh, outside of Waldo, and we had a CB radio in the house. And a trucker was calling for help. His truck had flipped. The wind had blown it, the uh, trailer over. And so um, a neighbor, somebody who had a snowmobile, picked this fellow up. I don't know his real name anymore. I can't remember that. But his handle was Crazy Freightliner. <laughs> he drove a Freightliner. And Crazy Freightliner ended up at our house. He came by snowmobile and stayed there overnight. And in the morning when we all got up, our, for some reason the front door had not been latched tightly and I had an entryway with plants in it and there was snow in the front entry and all my plants were frozen. <laughs> and, but the neighbors got together. Well, I remember a neighbor coming on a snowmobile stopping and saying, he was going into Waldo, uh, did we need any beer? <laughs> he was making a beer run. <laughs> But then that evening, all the neighbors got together because uh, the electricity was out and, and people said they had food in their freezers that was going to go bad. So I remember we had a coho salmon that my husband had caught um, up at Lake Michigan. And we got that out and cooked it on a grill. And we had a great big potluck with everybody's food that was going bad from their freezers. And had a really nice neighbor party that night. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you guys remember the uh, news reports, and it looked like uh, on TV that they were in the back of a men's room or something. You remember, does anybody remember that on TV, watching the uh, weather reports and stuff? They were like bare bones down to nothing. And it did. It looked like you were not in a TV studio. You know, probably in a restroom somewhere, but that was kind of cool. <laughs> you mentioned uh, the story of Lyman, Western Ohio. And as I understand it, Western Ohio, Northern Ohio got hit even more than around here, that they were really under some treacherous areas, as was, of course, a lot of the United States, including the area that you would expect. And that was upstate New York. <laughs> you remember that, Betty. Betty, would you yes, could you stand up here just for a moment and, and give us a a little report on where where you were during this? I was in Oswego, New York, and uh, we had a hurricane on a Sunday, and uh, I was managing a theater, and we were playing King Solomon's Mine. And the first show was ending and the hurricane started and the audience had to remain in the theater all night. 
this kid in the theater. And I was watching from the front door of the theater, and I could see pieces of glass from windows flying horizontally. It was really awesome. 3,000 3, roofs were affected, and the National Guard from Syracuse came to give us a hand, but for five days, it was pure hell. And you tried to open the door, did you say? Yeah, I tried to open the front door, and I was holding the handle, and my legs went up, and I was like a fry. <laughs> And the doorman and the usher pulled me back into the room. Wow. So it was quite an experience. I would bet. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Benny Gary. <laughs> Benny was associated also with theaters, you know, throughout his life, including the Strand Theater. Had had yes. quite a story about being with the Strand Theater here in Delaware, and uh, so. In 1948. 1948, when you were, wow, wow. Any other story here? Any other comment? Yes. This is a very quick one, but I'm sure some of you remember Franny Glenn, the Bueller's manager. I'm his wife. And he said, be sure to tell them. <laughs> be sure to tell them about somebody with, he left early that morning at the blizzard. He made it to Bueller's because he was the manager. And in the night, one of the nights, and I don't know which one it was, somebody about four o'clock in the morning was pounding on the door. And he goes to open the, the door thinking that something was really serious. <laughs> the guy said, I've just got to have beer and cigarettes. <laughs> and he got his beer and cigarettes and paid cash for it and left. But Franny was there for three days and he did a lot of dealings with the sheriff and the police from Delaware. They would come in and pick up items that, that people needed, you know, like baby food, and just all kinds of things. And they didn't have any heat, but we were on rural electric, and we had heat at home and electricity, so I was perfectly comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. See a hand back here, yes, Sandy? from the Franklin County Historical Society here. Okay, uh, I lived in Bryce, Ohio when the blizzard came. But I worked at the Columbus Zoo in Delaware County. And uh, of course, like anybody who does everything regular, I just got up in the morning, not thinking about it, it was just snow. Ate my breakfast, got in the car, took off. Of course, it wasn't just the regular snow, <laughs> and I had um, a big Oldsmobile, and the only way I could get through was floor it all the time. So that's what I was doing. I was determined to get to work. I was the person who lived the furthest away from the zoo, all the employees, <laughs> and I am. The, the one thing I remember the most coming into work was I came down 161, turned right on the 257, and I'm flooring it. No one has been on that road yet. And I get maybe halfway to the zoo, and a police car, Delaware County, Franklin, or whatever he was, coming at me with his lights on. He has his window open, and he's waving me to go back. If I had even let up on the gas, I wouldn't have never moved again. <laughs> so I'm still Florida coming at him, and I'm thinking, he is on the other side of the road. It's a four-lane highway. I'm just going to keep on going past him. When I got close enough, I realized he's on my side of the road. <laughs> he's on the wrong side. Oh, no. So when I got close enough, I still wasn't going to slow down. 
I flipped over on the other side. So I went around him the other way and I made it to work. <laughs> I got to work. That was only the beginning. <laughs> that was in the morning at 7 o'clock in the morning or whatever it was. And I, not only the parking lot was right by the dam for the employees. And where I worked was at the other end of the zoo. I was an ichthyologist, and I worked in the aquarium. So you know how far away the aquarium is from the dam. I had to walk through the blizzard, and I got all the way to the, to the aquarium, unlocked the door, and it was froze. I couldn't get the door open, even though it was unlocked. And by then, I was, thought I was going to die any minute, <laughs> and it was really bad. I, the only thing I could think of was go back to my car and get some tool out of it and try to get the door open. And so I walked all the way back, well, just about a half a mile at least, to my car. I got a hammer and a screwdriver and went back to the aquarium and chiseled the ice off. It was just covering all the doors all around that you couldn't couldn't get through at all. And uh, there's six doors and I had all of them unlocked and could not open any of them. Um, but I eventually chipped it out with a screwdriver and a hammer and I got in and the uh, electric was still on. Luckily, um, we have backup generators all over the uh, zoo in case something goes out. And I uh, started it up and made sure it was working. It's supposed to automatically come on if the electric goes off. But uh, the electric went off many times over the years, and the generator never started. So <laughs> you had to be there. <laughs> so I, had, I was there uh, several hours, and I started calling around everybody to see what other people were doing. And I got no answer anywhere. I was the only one at the zoo. <laughs> oh, no one else came. And I couldn't get in any other department because the doors were all locked and I only had keys to my department. So there was nothing I could do. I didn't even know who to call at home to find out anything. I was going through the phone list and no answers anywhere. And, and then I, I was the only person there and I'm listening to the radio all day, and, there, and I just went ahead and did my work and thinking, well, I will leave and do the same thing I, when I came. And I'm hearing all these bad things that are happening, and they said, well, call the, the National Guard if you need help. Um, I'm thinking, what are they, what's wrong with these people? Just keep on going, you know? <laughs> Well, at the end of the day, when I finally decided it's going to get dark, I've done everything I could do. I went out to my car, and I couldn't even find it. I mean, it really was bad. This was, well, you all know, a wall of snow all day long. And at the end of the day, I had to shovel my car out, went back to the building again, called the National Guard, come and get me. I told them where I was. They came out with snow plows. I think there was two dump trucks maybe or something. I, I can't even remember what vehicles they had. But they were plowing and I was driving behind them down 257. When we got to 161, they turned around and went back this way. <laughs> and I was that was it for me, you know. I, had, I was on my own and I just uh, remember turning up the hill at uh, 161 and I flooring it again and, and uh, right there about halfway up the hill I, I come up just like what you were talking about I came up flying along as fast as I could go and I see this bump in front of me and I think that's a car it looks like a Volkswagen Beetle that had that shape and I swerved and it sure enough it was and I missed it just I don't know how but I eventually got home, and I did come back to work every day. I think uh, about three days before any other employees came in, and I was the only one that never missed it. <laughs>
County Historical Society is supported by dues, grants, donations, and volunteers. We welcome your help with any of our worthwhile projects.